There's a story in a John Lee's autobiography. There was a senior monk in Bangkok who was sick. And so John Lee went to visit him. Now this senior monk had very little use for the forest tradition. So it wasn't the case that he had a lot of faith in a John Lee. But a John Lee just sat in one corner of the room and meditated. And after a while, the senior monk began to have a sense that something was coming from a John Lee's corner, having an effect on his body. So I asked a John Lee, what are you doing? And a John Lee said, I'm making a gift of quiet, a gift of silence. And the senior monk said, well, whatever it is, keep on doing it. It feels really good. And so John Lee would go back every day, and after a while they started talking, and he actually taught meditation to the senior monk, who had never meditated before, and ended up changing that monk's ideas about the forest tradition, about the possibility of getting results from meditation. Now John Lee's powers of concentration were very strong. But the basic principle applies to us as well. When your mind is quiet, you have an effect on the people around you. And often when people are sick or weak is when they pick up on it most. So when you're sitting here meditating, you're not the only one who's going to benefit. The people around you benefit as well. You have a good influence on them. Because most people's minds just wash around without any real fixed foundation. And if they can sense a foundation nearby, even though it's not inside them, they can pick up on that sense of stability. And it's calming to them, reassuring. So that's one way that your meditation can have an impact on others. You try to carry it into whatever situation you're in. This is why it's important that you remember that the skills you're learning here as you're sitting here with your eyes closed aren't meant to be used only here. The skills you can use wherever you go. After all, you go with your body, you go with your breath. And for some reason, it, it's very easy to think about all kinds of things all at once. We're used to multitasking. Even before we had computers and other things, our minds had some multitasking going on, thinking about that, worrying about this, remembering that, planning this, all going on pretty much at the same time. And yet people often say that while they're working, they can't focus on the breath at the same time. What you've got to learn how to do is clear out all that unnecessary multitasking and just put the breath in its place. So you can work and be sensitive to how the breath energy is going in your body. Where it feels good, where it doesn't feel good, where your trigger centers are. In other words, the spots in the body that tend to catch up most quickly when there's fear or anger. lust, greed, whatever. Some people find it primarily around the solar plexus, other people it's more in the chest. It actually can be anywhere in the body, but you want to learn where your triggers are so you can very consciously keep them relaxed, open, still. And if you can't focus your attention on your whole body, at least be sensitive to the trigger points. So if something comes up and you sense a stirring there or a tightening there, relax it immediately. And try to hold that sense, protect that sense of relaxation as you breathe in, as you breathe out, as you go through whatever the situation is. 
when you're feeling attacked from somebody else. Okay, go right there. Protect that spot. And you find that as you have a protected spot, you're more likely to think of the right thing to say, or at least the least harmful thing to say, the more appropriate thing to say. It's not 100% guaranteed, but you're giving yourself a much better chance because you're coming from a better place. This is another way in which your meditation can influence other people. When you have a sense of well-being, or at least one stable spot inside, you're feeling less threatened. When you feel less threatened, your actions are less, less harmful, and they actually be more beneficial. You have something to share, something good to share. When the mind is still, it's also a lot easier to remember whatever lessons you've learned about right speech, right action, remembering to keep the needs of other people in mind, remembering to keep their where they are in mind. Because when your mind is less consumed with your own suffering, you can have more room for considering the sufferings of others. This is why one of the most ironic things about meditation is people say it's a selfish activity. They say people are sitting there with their eyes closed, ignoring the problems of the world. Well, we do have our eyes closed, but we're working on an important skill, a skill that's not used right here and only right here as we meditate, but also as you, your right here moves through the world. When there is a sense of well-being in your heart, you can just let it flow out through the body, kind of radiate out. Then you have a much better foundation for doing and saying and thinking the right thing. Again, it's not all automatic. I mean, for everybody who whose minds were rightly concentrated, or at least well concentrated, could think of always the right thing to do and say and think. We wouldn't have had to wait until the Buddha gained awakening. It would have happened a long time before that, because people were practicing concentration before that. But whatever wisdom you've learned and we do now have the benefit of the wisdom of a lot of people from the past. It's a lot easier to have it at your fingertips when the mind is still. And you have the sense of awareness that's flowing out in all directions from a stable center. So this is your gift of stillness to yourself, to the people around you, and remembering that you're not the only one who benefits often is a good way of energizing your practice. Sometimes you think, well, this is good enough for me for tonight, but then you ask yourself, well, do I have enough to share with other people? Can I maintain this? So when you get up from the meditation, try to maintain that sense of balance. It's like balancing a cup of coffee on a saucer while you're sitting, and then getting up and keeping it balanced and not spilling anything, walking through the room and not spilling anything. In the same way you don't want your concentration to spill, to tip over. You want it to stay balanced. And that sense of balance and stillness, that's your gift. to learn how to protect it. At first it's going to be a little awkward, but over time you find that it is possible to keep this balanced state of mind, this balanced sense of the breath being nourishing, open, refreshing inside, and doing other things at the same time. This is one of the reasons why we do walking meditation, so you learn how to maintain that sense of balance and stillness even though the body is moving. 
And then from there you can add other activities on top of that. But always think of this as your foundation. It's not just one more ball to keep in the air as you're juggling all kinds of things. That's the spot where you're standing as you juggle. In other words, it's essential for everything else you want to do. When you've started getting used to having this sense of the center, you wonder how you functioned before you had it. And although simply concentrating the mind is not going to solve all your problems, it makes the problems a lot easier. So don't abandon the center. Learn how to keep it going in, in all your activities, in all your sitting, standing, walking, lying down, whatever. Give this first priority. And it will spread its good influence around.